Bones. Nuclear weapons, the sword of Damocles that hangs over mankind, should be completely prohibited and thoroughly destroyed over time to make the world free from such weapons. Speaking before world leaders in Switzerland, Chinese President Xi Jinping outlines a bold strategic and economic vision. Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu and this is The Heat. President Xi Jinping this week's trip was an opportunity to make the case for China as the leader of a world where only international cooperation can solve big problems. In his keynote address before the World Economic Forum in Davos, the Chinese president called for joint efforts towards making the benefits of economic globalization available to all. Then later at the United Nations in Geneva, President Xi called for the world to unite on everything from environmental protection to terrorism and nuclear disarmament. For more, we turn now to CGTN's Jack Barton in Davos. And Jack, take us through uh, more of those key points from those two speeches. Well, here at the World Economic Forum, Arnon, it was very much a rallying cry for the type of globalization that has brought China so much uh, economic growth over the previous the decades. But um, also a recommitment for China to open its markets up and for the markets to become more transparent. On top of that, though, President Xi portrayed globalization as a double-edged sword. He said while it brought great benefits to many people, it was nonetheless harming others. It need to be reformed. There need to be a new type of globalization that could bridge that uh, growing divide between the very rich and the very poor, or as Oxfam uh, a study here at the World Economic Forum pointed out the other day the top r eight richest people in the world controlling the same amount of wealth as the bottom half. There seems to be a rejection of that kind of paradigm here at the WEF. But he also touched on uh, climate change, calling for countries not to back away from the deal signed in Paris a few years ago, which uh, US President-elect Donald Trump is threatening to do. And uh, he touched on that as well at the United Nations, where he talked about nuclear disarmament. The most important message, perhaps, at the United Nations and in some of the references to the institutions here in the World Economic Forum is that President Xi believes for globalization to work, for it to be reformed, there needs to be strong international organizations. This, at a time of rising isolationism, uh, rising a sense of protectionism, uh, many people worried that countries are backing away from these institutions. So this was a, a recommitment from China, the world's second biggest economy, that no, these institutions must be strengthened if there is to be more international cooperation. And Jack, what's been the reaction to President Xi's comments? Well, even if these were more normal times, if there wasn't the election of uh, Donald Trump in the United States, if there wasn't the prospect of Britain pulling away from the European Union, uh, still this would have been a very well-received speech. Certainly everybody I spoke to said it was more comprehensive than they had expected. They liked the recommitment to globalization clearly because of what's happening in the United States. It calmed the meeting. It acted like an anchor in the storm. But they also like that key message that there needs to be reform. A, a poll out here at the forum of uh, more than 1,300 top executives from companies in 79 countries show that only 13% of them believe that globalization is now uh, causing more good than harm. That's an incredible figure because it's not coming from workers in factories that may have been shut down uh, to off-source uh, work overseas. This is coming from top executives. So clearly there's a lot of dissatisfaction. Many people here want the system to be overhauled. They want to take a fresh look at globalization. So that was very important that President Xi stressed that part of the message for so much in his speech. Uh, there's been a lot of positive feedback on that. Thanks, Jack. That's CGTN's Jack Barton reporting from Davos in Switzerland. Let's get to our panel right now. Joining us here in Washington is Saurabh Gupta. He's a resident senior fellow with the Institute for China-America Studies. Also with us, CGTN correspondent Wang Guan. And Afshin Mulavi is a senior fellow at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Thanks to all of you. I've been listening to those sentiments there from President Xi Jinping. We hear very assertive China, China making its voice heard. But are we seeing China now beginning to take a lead role in setting the international 
security and economic agenda? Well, I think certainly on the economic agenda. I mean, this was a robust defense of globalization in the heart of places uh, that, that, that advocates for globalization, Davos and the World Economic Forum. And I think what, you know, it's important to remember, on, on you know, the old adage, where you stand depends on where you sit, right? You know, if you sit in Shanghai or Mumbai or Dubai, globalization has been good to you. You know, we are living in an era of unprecedented opportunity, connectivity, economic growth, particularly in the emerging world. If you stand in, you know, parts of the deindustrialized American Midwest, that's the double-edged sword that President Xi was referring to. And I think that was really important for him not to just make a robust rah-rah defense of globalization, but to understand that there are going to be winners and losers uh, and to acknowledge those losers. And it is important for figures like President Xi uh, and other world leaders to actually start thinking about globalization, maybe 3.0, 4.0, wh whatever number we are right now. Wang Wen, we talked to our correspondent uh, there in Davos about some of the response there has been to the speeches made by President Xi. Uh, the former Swedish Prime Minister Carl Bildt say that at the moment there is a vacuum in uh, global leadership when it comes to economic policy, when it comes to economic planning, and President Xi uh, is stepping in there. Is that what we are seeing right now? Right. I think what I picked up from President Xi's speech in Davos was that he said, once people around the world considered um, globalization to be a treasure cave found by Alibaba, and now some folks all of a sudden think it is a Pandora's box. You know, obviously throughout the speech, I think there was a very subtle but very strong response to Donald Trump, to West, Western leaders, to the right-wing political parties in Western Europe, um, in that, you know, he says, look, there are winners and losers, you know, during the um, economic crisis in 2009, uh, millions of Chinese migrant workers lost their jobs from the manufacturing plants. Uh, and China did not complain, and he himself did not run on the platform uh, writing on the grievances of those uh, Chinese uh, farmers who lost, lost their jobs to get elected. So, nor should Western leaders uh, in the Western Hemisphere. And he also pointed out, I think, that China needs the world as much as the other way around. You know, 30, 40 percent of China's GDP comes from its trade, uh, trading relations with the Western world, and uh, Amer China is also America's third and fastest growing market. So obviously he sends this message that uh, we need uh, each other. So Rob, as Afshin said, we had a very robust defense of globalization. There we also heard very significant comments on nuclear disarmament, on security, on terrorism, and how to fight terrorism. What did you make of the speeches and the fact that they were made in Switzerland at this World Economic Forum and at the UN as well? I thought they were both very profound and powerful speeches which, went, which tackled the great global challenges of the day and tackled them frontally. It was, of course, important to do this in Switzerland, but I also think one of the important things to bear in mind is the timing at which he has, which, with which uh, he has delivered the speeches. Of course, it is just two days be, uh, before, or a day before Donald Trump is going to be inaugurated as president. But the themes he talked about are the themes which animated the founders of the post -cold, of, of the core of the post World War II system, the Bretton Woods system and the UN system. He is talking about President Xi, that is, about a renewal of that system which is fraying today and which has delivered enormous prosperity today but re requires reform and is currently under threat with the new incoming administration and with the general tone in the West of retreat and retrenchment. So I found this timing to be very important. So would you say there was a recognition there on his part that these institutions that you talk about are under threat? Well, there is, absolutely. He talked about that. And he talked in a fair amount of detail on, in both speeches in how these institutions need to be reformed, particularly the economic institutions uh, like the IMF, et cetera, because the political institutions, the UN Security Council, et cetera, reform is a little more difficult to do. Mm -hmm. But he did talk in significant depth about reform of these institutions. Right. The problem has been that we tend to think of the, uh, from 1945 to 2017 as just one, one continuous period. But perhaps there might be a disjuncture in 1990 onwards from the, when the Cold War ended and there was this unilateralist moment of the United States which led to a sort of a la carte multi multilateralism. It led to financial capitalism going completely off, off, off the charts. It led to the 
infringement of state sovereignty. And these have created more problems rather than right. s resolving them. And so he tr he's trying to bring attention to those issues. All right, Afshin, let's look at some of the specifics here. Talk about timing. Let's listen to what the president had to say about globalization. Let's watch. It's true that economic globalization has created new problems, but this is not a justification to write off economic globalization altogether. Rather, we should adapt to and guide economic globalization. Pursuing protectionism is just like locking oneself in a dark room. While wind and rain may be kept outside, so are light and air. No one will emerge as a winner in a trade war. Let me ask you, well, first, was this directed at Donald Trump? I think it was, it certainly. I think there's, there was a lot of backhanded comments directed at Donald Trump in Davos. Uh, but, but I think, uh, you know, there is genuine concern uh, in Beijing um, about some of the rhetoric coming out of uh, President-elect Trump, uh, some of the senior cabinet officials he has appointed, um, uh, some of whom have, are on record as being, you know, pretty hawkish on China in particular, um, and, and having a protectionist streak in them. And, and I think what, what it would be very dangerous um, if, if some of these policies or some of the, the, the rhetoric became policy. Right. Uh, because, you know, as Guan noted, I mean, it's a, such an important relationship. I mean, we're talking about $500 billion upwards of trade between the United States uh, and China. Um, and, 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 you know, there is, in a sense, these are the two biggest economies in the world. You don't, the global economy has enough problems. Uh, you don't want the two biggest economies in the world going at each other in a trade war. Right, you know, you talked about globalization moving forward, globalization 2.0, 3.0, whatever the case may be. There was also uh, parts of that speech which talked about adapting globalization, of reforming globalization and uh, strengthening institutions as well. Do you see China take the lead in that? You know, I, th I think, you know, you know, what China is doing with its One Belt, One Road initiative, I think is a great example of, uh, you know, a, a country taking on leadership on an important issue, building connectivity, building infrastructure. Look, the, the history of, you know, the prosperity of the post-World War II order has often been written by those who are most connected. Um, and, and, you know, by building infrastructure around that region, you're actually, you know, helping you know, build prosperity. So I think those are the kind of initiatives uh, that I think China has already shown leadership on. Look, and on somebody needs to defend globalization. Uh, it is taking a battering in the Western world. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, at least, you know, we have President Xi depend, de defending it. Right. I want to stay with that. Wang Guan, the president, you know, very carefully spelt out what globalization has meant for China. Let's take a listen to some of what he had to say. China's development is an opportunity for the world. China has not only benefited from economic globalization, but has contributed to it. China's rapid growth has been a sustained, powerful engine for global economic stability and expansion. The interconnected development of China and a large number of other countries has made the world economy more balanced. China's remarkable achievement in poverty reduction has contributed to a more inclusive global growth. And China's continuous progress in reform and opening up has lent much momentum to an open world economy. So I don't think anybody would argue that globalization has contributed enormously to China's economic development. President Xi also talked about interconnected growth. But how, you know, getting back to Afshin's point, how does he sell that to a world which has become very skeptical of globalization, which in many ways is looking in another direction? Yeah, of course. I think there are concerns about China's uh, opening up policies. There are a skepticism, of course, uh, when it comes to transport sector in China, telecommunications sector, energy sector, media sector. Uh, probably uh, bar barriers could be brought down further. But the fact of the matter is, um, as we speak today, China will issue its uh, 2016 economic data. Uh, economic growth is forecast to be, growth is 6.7%. Uh, and consumption is contributing to an increasing amount of the GDP. Uh, and these Chinese consumers, consumption power, will translate into consumers who are buying Western products, you know, uh, like Apple for the 40% of its iPhones are sold in China. Kentucky Fried Chicken is everywhere you turn in China, third tier, fourth tier cities, everywhere you go. Um, so Ameri again, like I said, China is the third largest market for US exports. The US exports to China, uh, despite what Donald Trump has said, actually grew uh, some eight, 9% every year. 
Okay, we are going to take a break right now. More of our conversation when we return. Stay with us. You're watching The Heat.